This has something to do with espionage. We had Nigel Dunkley, a spy, and I would have liked to have given over the word from him to another former spy. Because you also recently, Annie Machon, uh, decided to move to Berlin. Um, and I would like to ask you uh, what is different in the post Snowden situation from Crystal Doors? I think it's a very interesting time for whistleblowers post Snowden. Um, obviously, he knew the risks he was running because the US has been waging a war against whistleblowers anyway for the last um, six years. Obama has pr tried to prosecute or successfully prosecuted more um, whistleblowers coming out of the intelligence agencies in the US than all his predecessors put together since 1917. So if that's not a war on whistleblowers, I don't know what is. And against that background, Edward Snowden still took the steps he took which was to expose to the world this global panopticon surveillance state. And I think post Snowden, it's going to be even more difficult for whistleblowers. So unless you're pretty much uh, an uber geek and can really work your way around internet security, it's, there's a very high likelihood that you will get caught now before you can actually make it to the media. I was going to invite Jamie to come up and read a, it's a letter from Snowden, so it's fresh news. Um, Is Jamie going to read it? No. Yeah, we want to have an artistic intervention. Okay, we're keeping the mic back here for the rest of the ride. Um, I'm not sure why I'm reading this, but I'll do it anyway. After that, we should sing a song. It's been one year. Technology has been a liberating force in our lives. It allows us to create and share the experiences that make us human effortlessly. But in secret, our very own government, one bound by the Constitution and its Bill of Rights, has reverse engineered something beautiful into a tool of mass surveillance and oppression. We've come a long way, but there's more to be done. Edward J. Snowden, American. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got a, you have a, an email from your uh, husband. <laughs> You're working on this on a daily basis too. Can you say something about the specificity of working on this in, in Berlin? Why, why Berlin? Well, because we had people like Wow Holland 30 years ago talking about informational self-determination and to protect your data, <clears throat> um, public to keep the uh, public data uh, open and then private private. And they made this to a culture and of course the CCC was born. And oddly enough, after that KGB hack, uh, also 25 years ago, the, the, the CCC moved to Berlin and then uh, fomented this kind of culture here, which meant that when this did happen, when uh, Laura Poitras was working on her film, she happened to be in Berlin because she had less surveillance and, than, than Hassel in the States. Um, Jake used to come here and hang out with us at the Telekommunisten Stammtisch or at the Republika and do talks, you know, so it was, it was common for them to f and feel at ease in Berlin. That culture, that community was already here. It didn't just happen overnight, as, just to answer your questions. Mrs. Bundeskanzlerin, I'm calling you. Um, we have a small problem. Yeah, yeah, we have a problem. NSA is spying on your phone. <laughs> you need to destroy this phone right now. <laughs> you can, you can. Um, I think in terms of why uh, a lot of whistleblowers are attracted to Berlin is, is precisely because of what we saw when we went to the Stasi Museum earlier today. Um, I, it brought back flash, sort of flashback memories for me because it was very similar to what MI5 was like in, even in the early 1990s when I was recruited. Um, so I think why people are attracted to Berlin? Because we have something called the Stasi Museum, not the Stasi HQ. And that is the simple answer that you got, you managed to get rid of it by people power. So, actually you have to pay more attention to the back of the bus. If we are going to talk about Rosa Parks, you can't ignore the back of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> this discussion of what makes Berlin comfortable for all of these people that are dealing with surveillance, often tends to forget that there are actually people that have been surveilled not by the Stasi, but by the BKA in recent years for using terminology like anti-gentrification, 
like, um, like that's still something that you can be surveilled for and watched telephone telephonically surveilled in Germany now. So like the West German archives have not been opened up, but people still do get surveilled and charged with things like terrorism, and that happens today in Germany. And we should not forget that because this idea that's in a paradise of freedom, we cannot just talk about the Stasi and ignore what's happening in Germany today. I'd like to ask actually Christian Humboldt of Transparency International about, you know, what, what does it mean that a secret service brands itself on transparency? Are we seeing a shift in the meaning of transparency in the post-Snowden world? I think we see a big uh, transparency discourse by many people in power who use this word. A word that is really on vogue. But to me, like the main difference, is, first of all, transparency and privacy are two sides of the same coin for me. And the difference, the criterion, is the criterion of power. Because those in power should be transparent and those powerless need the privacy. And I think that's very much what we saw already at the Stasi Unterlagenbehörde when you saw the spirit of the law we have there. That was a film clip by Simon Klose, uh, one part of his documentary project about the Magical Secrecy Tour. My name is Leslie, I was a co-producer of the tour, and I wanted to tell you a bit about how the project uh, worked and what we discovered by making this uh, uh, journey through Berlin on a bus. We, we basically were making a trip through Berlin with a group of people who were included hackers, uh, artists, activists, ex-spies, a whistleblower, a lawyer, some of the people that you saw on the bus already, um, a number of people coming together, traveling through Berlin for a full nine hours, uh, traveling into the history and present sort of world of surveillance culture, and having a discussion about it on the bus, trying to learn from one another what is actually going on and whether we believe that Berlin deserves uh, this right to be, say, the, call itself, say, the global uh, capital of uh, processing and reacting to and resisting global surveillance. Um, so just to give you a sense, here we are uh, at Teufelsberg, um, the former NSA listening station, with Nigel Dunkley, who was a passenger on our bus and gave the tour there with one other person. Uh, he's a guy who was a former spy for MI6. He was working at Teufelsberg during the Cold War. And as he was tell telling us a bit about his work there during the tour, because I was standing next to a Russian guy and um, a tech person and a historian, um, I was listening to what he was saying, but I was also, because of the heightened awareness state we were in doing this tour on the first anniversary of the Snowden leaks, also paying attention to these other things, like why is Nigel's hand roughly facing in the direction of Moscow? And what about this graffiti? What does it tell us about the volatile history of a place like this sector of Berlin and possibly therefore also the volatile future of this part of Berlin? And what about that radome, that radar dome up on the left? What was that radome uh, designed to conceal in terms of technology and which direction was that listening device usually pointed in when it was working there? These are the kinds of things that happened because of who we were on the bus and the fact that we came together to uh, experience the surveillance culture of Berlin, but also uh, sort of listening to each other and, and maybe widening our usual perspective of things. So I'd like to argue that Berlin uh, has a history of surveillance that is more varied and complex and uh, interesting, I guess you could say, uh, in shorthand, than that of any other city in the world today. That makes it a very interesting place to uh, consider what's going on in the global surveillance situation that we're in, and also possibly to react to it in different ways. It's not just the history of, uh, of Berlin, but also the current communities that are in Berlin and the current things that are going on in Berlin. 
that make give it this special stature. So really our mystery tour was about this intersection between the past and the present. Of the dozens, and I'm, I wish I could tell you if I had time, I would tell you all the places we considered going on our tour because there are dozens and dozens of fantastically rich possibilities. Uh, we had to limit it to a few that we could actually do with 60 people on a bus in one nine hour period. Therefore, we ended up with this selection of destinations, which um, are in shorthand, but just to give you a sense, the inevitable visit to the Stasi Museum and Archives in former East Berlin. On the other end, the TB stands for Teufelsberg, where we just saw uh, the former NSA listening station. Um, TM stands for Transmediale Offices, where the bus departed. HQ times two, that was just a shorthand I put up for uh, capturing the fact that this was a uh, the address, it happens to be the offices both of Google and Daimler, so that's where we discuss some corporate espionage and also uh, corporate um, uh, spying on, on corporate surveillance. We went up to the BND, Bundesnachrichtendienst, uh, Germany's foreign intelligence service, down to the topography of terror, uh, former headquarters for the Gestapo and the SS and Nazi German times, and then past the USA embassy, uh, one of over 150 embassies in Berlin. Of course, um, uh, embassies are there to protect their citizens, but are also uh, legendary hotspots for espionage, so that was a natural thing to include on the tour. Um, so this just to give you an, a sense of the, of the uh, map. We gave uh, some uh, actually programmed tours in certain locations where we actually visited things very carefully with an expert, usually uh, actually every time with someone on our actual bus the whole day, so we have a continuing conversation. But we also had a lot of loose time on the bus itself to talk and process these things and get into debates. Um, I just showed the clip from Simon this, that was about being on the bus, so I'll give you a flavor of that. The um, bus, I would say, became another site in Berlin. Temporary, yes. Rolling, yes. Uh, but moving among these, uh, these static sites, it kind of created another moment in the history of surveillance culture. Hopefully, what we were doing was bringing a higher level of consciousness of the surveillance history and um, present uh, surveillance situation of Berlin by our combined forces and carrying that consciousness around somehow. So. Uh, for what that was worth. It was filmed by Simon Klose, and uh, our mediator on the ride was uh, Christopher Gansing, who's a the artistic director of Transmediale, who, along with NK Project, were my uh, co-producers for this event. While we were on the bus, going out toward the Stasi archives, right at the beginning, Christopher said to everyone on the bus, okay, you guys, um, don't forget this paradox of seeing, which is that when you look in one direction, when you focus on something and you're trying to pay attention to it and learn from it, there's automatically going to be something you're not seeing. There's going to be the inevitable blind spots. And these aren't just the blind spots from our the mechanical reality of our bus, but the conceptual blind spots, because I'm used to seeing something this way, someone else usually sees it this other way. And we all know that even as we're very sure that we're right, often the more certain we are, the, the less likely we are to actually understand something more completely. So we also reminded ourselves that Snowden, uh, in his revelations, revealed colossal blind spots, which are very important, not only for revealing the technological realities of our times and some of the geopolitical realities of our times and other things, but also for giving us uh, the sense that we are now able to see things that we were blind to before. But we also wanted to be very careful not to let that um, be something we would take for granted, but also make an effort on this tour to actually use the Snowden leaks as a, as a way to uh, motivate ourselves to look anew at Berlin, but also uh, to not get too comfortable with the idea that we actually understood anything. So we're trying to look in a fresh way. So I just, with the little time that I have with you, I just wanted to mention two different ways of seeing that I think are valuable that we took away from this tour. Uh, I think there's many, many more, and if I had an indefinite amount of time, I would, I would tell you about a lot of others. But the first of the two that I will tell you about is uh, captured by my slide showing Nike um, hindsight glasses, just to stand for the concept of seeing behind you, seeing historically, looking into the past. So 
this is a really interesting thing about Berlin that history doesn't function the same way there, I think, that it does in other places, and you'll see why in a minute. But I just want to, in order to kind of activate the importance of Berlin's history, I just want to put a pin in a couple of moments. I think everybody already knows what these moments would be. You could probably name them already. But let me just put a pin in these moments without elaborating, and just so that they're on this uh, conceptual map so that we can be aware of them. Um, I think maybe actually most people would say that the history of Berlin's surveillance culture really begins in the 20th century. But I'm going to propose to you that it actually starts earlier than that when Berlin was the seat of the Kingdom of Prussia and the German Empire, and that uh, there was a kind of authoritarian uh, form of data collection of mass uh, population under uh, the statesman Otto von Bismarck, and that this, I uh, don't know what you would call it, say a, um, um, a preemptively anti-socialist socialist state uh, is actually maybe the first interesting place to look at the history of data collection in Berlin. I'm going to flip forward here. We're now in the Wannsee Conference House. Uh, this is in the Wannsee district of Berlin. This is a building where on January 20th, 1942, Reinhard Heydrich, uh, then director of the Reich Main Security Office, convenes a meeting with 14 other higher-ups in the Nazi government uh, to coordinate and plan out extermination of Jews in Europe. And note that uh, this document, which I think now rates as one of the major documents um, concerning the datification of humanity uh, was uh, supplied to the meeting by one of its participants, that's Adolf Eichmann, and this details a number of Jews in each territory that is either occupied and controlled by Germany or not. You see the total in the bottom line, zusammen über elf Millionen, so altogether over 11 million. I'm now flipping fast forward uh, to after the war. We're now standing in East Berlin in the Stasi uh, compound, which is the headquarters for all of the Stasi uh, in East Germany. And we're facing uh, House 1, uh, House 1, which was among many other uh, buildings uh, the, in the compound. This one is the office, uh, was the office of Eric Milke, who was a head of the Stasi for over 30 years. Uh, I, I'm assuming I don't have to say a lot about the Stasi. Everybody uh, probably has a pretty florid uh, set of ideas about it. Um, I'm going to move along to uh, this image from 1985 uh, showing uh, Teufelsberg uh, NSA listening station in full throttle, uh, working 24 hours a day. Um, I, we heard an interesting talk about Teufelsberg last night. I, uh, no need to make any kind of sexual pun about the uh, three radomes to the right, I guess. Um, Freudians and feminists will go to town on that, but I, I wanted to say um, 1961, and actually this, this is an interesting little detail, it was in July of 1961 that the site was discovered by Allied spies as an interesting place to listen out for uh, what's going on in the Eastern Bloc, or at least that's what they claimed they were listening to. Um, so July 1961, the, the, the top of the hill of Teufelsberg is, is discovered as a promising, uh, fruitful place to, to listen out. One month later, the Berlin Wall goes up, August 1961. Starts on August 13, but this picture is obviously from a bit after that. Uh, November 9, 1989, the wall comes down. Just want to quickly say that I think this is a really important moment uh, in the history of the world and the history of Berlin, but in particular with this topic about whether Berlin deserves to be considered a, a capital of reflection on the significance of mass surveillance in the global digital era um, and uh, preparing responses to it. Uh, it is interesting to see that the wall comes down in 1989, really at the moment when the emergence of di digital culture just starts to take off. So just as it's healing itself from this split and restitching itself together. Berlin has also got in its, in its post-wall DNA, if you like, the beginning of the digital uh, era. Uh, so now we, one year later, the, the former offices of Eric Milka are now a museum, uh, which we visited, and one of the passengers on our bus asked, well, when is the NSA going to be uh, a museum? When is the head office of the NSA going to be a museum? And while it's not uh, yet a, mu a museum, um, 
uh, it is true that Teufelsberg, the former listening post, is a sort of museum-like place where you can go and you can paint there, um, you can visit it, and it's a privately managed historic site. Reunification, I'm gonna go forward because I, I only have a few minutes left and I wanna get to the, a really interesting point. This is a, uh, just a display of the German constitution. Uh, I think anybody uh, looking at uh, Berlin from the magical secrecy tour point of view can't help but notice, uh, uh, first of all, how hard it was for Germany to gain these incredible points that are made in its constitution, and therefore how poignant it is to go and see in abbreviated form here in this public display. Uh, you can read the, the articles of the constitution and see just how um, not healthy some of them are that we now realize thanks to the Snowden leaks, particularly the one on the left there that looks really tiny. Uh, it's sort of in the middle distance, but the smallest one, uh, Article 10, my personal favorite, um, which says something like privacy of uh, letters, posts, and telecommunications shall remain inviolable, with the word inviolable uh, normally meaning um, not to be tampered with under any circumstances. So. Um, one other way of seeing that we really got to appreciate on our trip uh, through Berlin is uh, the artistic way of seeing, and this is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of the human eye and sight lines and per peripheral vision being kind of figured out for the first time. Uh, I want to propose to you that uh, artists, whether they're digital artists or, or, or artists working in painting or any other art form, uh, can sometimes also supply incredible insight that help us to see into blind spots in ways that uh, historians and, and more logical approaches to reality um, do not. So this is inc incredibly valuable to supplement one way of looking with another. Um, for the purposes of this Congress, with its title being uh, A New Dawn, um, I just wanted to go back to a painting first exhibited in Berlin 200 years ago, still hanging there in the uh, Alte uh, Nationalgalerie, and it's by uh, Caspar uh, David Friedrich. Uh, it's called a monk, The Monk by the Sea. No one is really sure if it shows a monk. Uh, it could just be any, anybody. Um, but I think uh, post the Magical Secrecy Tour, uh, he looks a lot more like a hacker than uh, anything else. And that this is a really interesting uh, representation uh, from today's point of view of the concept of a blind spot. This is just mist and fog and clouds with maybe a hint of transparency and enlightenment in the distance. Um, so even, even artwork that is from a pre-digital era, I think can be seen completely anew uh, when we think about it in these terms and show us things that may suggest something about our own uh, priorities and our own um, vulnerabilities. Uh, maybe also provide some inspiration. And another area that's very rich in Berlin, of course, is the performing arts. I just want to note here one um, very interesting uh, uh, theater, the Schaubühne Theater in, uh, in west uh, part of Berlin. Um, this uh, uh, caption for this photo should probably be um, something's rotten in the surveillance state of, Den of Denmark. This is Lars Eidinger, the great, staggeringly uh, great, I would say, uh, actor portraying Hamlet um, at the Schaubühne. And this is Shakespeare's great tragedy about surveillance and the toll it takes um, on, uh, the toll that surveillance and self-censorship take on a person and a family and a a whole society, uh, the existential and ontological crisis that results when someone uh, is, is forced to ask, um, okay, I'm being watched, so should I change my behavior and, and pretend to be myself, just act myself and perform myself? And if I do that for a while, what if I mistake that self for my real self and will I go crazy? And if I'm crazy, is life worth living? And I really think that, that this is a great Shakespeare play about the very problem. Also, this staging is extraordinary. This is a Thomas Ostermeyer production with a lot of soil on the stage. This is really a Berlin production of Hamlet. The soil is very thick. Every time they try to put something in it, like a, a corpse, or a symbol of power like the sword or the crown or just tears of grief or what have you. Um, it doesn't stay in there, it just keeps popping up. It just keeps coming back on the surface of the stage. Just, they can't get anything to go into the past. I think it's a really interesting insight. This is a peripheral vision from these artists. What is really going on in Berlin? 
is that the history of this place uh, can't quite stay historical. It comes up into the present. So all of these things we were talking about earlier from the historical vision standpoint, they are very much vibrant and febrile and alive in Berlin in ways that make it possible for them to serve a, a wider understanding. Just wanted to thank Lars, also this great actor, for um, serving as our, uh, for being in this uh, photograph by, uh, taken by a uh, surveillance camera at the American Academy in Berlin. It, we use this as a publicity uh, image for the Magical Secrecy Tour. On our tour, we had some great artists as well who widened our perspective. One was Michelle Tehran. She, she had an interceptor set up inside the bus. We had these monitors. And uh, what happened was it, she was able to capture some private uh, CCTV footage so that as we're going around Berlin thinking about, uh, about government surveillance and corporate surveillance and, and the rest, she was giving us flickering images of, of uh, private surveillance happening around us wherever we were moving with the bus. At Teufelsberg, we have uh, in the Ray Dome a special performance uh, during the tour by Jan Peter Sontag, the sound artist. Uh, he built a, a, some special equipment which was able to capture um, some electrical activity in the stratosphere. So we sat and listened to this extraordinary crackling and whooshing, really strange kind of music of this stratosphere, uh, which also threw uh, into perspective a completely different understanding of the history of the NSA listening post and how what normal listening would have been like at this location not so long ago. We ended our tour uh, uh, at Seabase uh, Space Station where um, we had an interesting discussion about the future of transparency and privacy. I think the creative artistic environment that we were in uh, helped to promote a really interesting and uh, playful discussion which was useful at that moment to sort of imagine different possibilities. And um, it would have been a very different discussion had it taken place at say the Stasi Museum or someplace else. Next month at the Transmediale Festival in Berlin, uh, we will be um, talking about the Magical Secrecy Tour in more detail, and there will be a pretty um, interesting panel about it. I hope if you're interested, you'll come and see some of the further videos from Simon Klose about this, uh, this tour. I personally, uh, I'm very interested in, in participating in order to um, to talk about another thing that I think is very useful about this uh, uh, journey we made to um, apply to the current discussion coming out of uh, the post-Snowden um, debates and questions about how to respond, and that is, um, I think we hear a lot use this term panopticon, the global panopticon, well, any and he just used it in the video clip as well. And um, with all, all due respect to everyone who uses this phrase, um, it's really a problem because uh, what's going on today is uh, categorically different from a panopticon in ways that are actually, unfortunately, I think a lot worse. Um, but I think in, if we don't get the right name for, the, for what's happening, uh, we're gonna be in um, trouble. So it will help us to actually address what's really going on if we find the right language. And if I do have more than one minute, I will tell you, do I have more than one minute? One minute, okay, so I would love to tell you a juicy um, detail about the Panopticon idea, but I guess you'll have to come to uh, Transmediale in Berlin, and I, I don't have time here. Let me just wrap up by saying, um, these are fast changing times. So we're moving ahead quickly, and it can be heroic and feel good to have our focus firmly set on a particular goal and to be working toward that as we uh, think about what's the right thing to do next and where do we want to head. But I think if we learn anything from the Magical Secrecy Tour, uh, which was sort of based on this very simple equation of Berlin in its current and former and peripheral uh, ways plus Snowden, what we learned is that um, it really does help to look at the past, to look in corners of your field that you wouldn't consider necessarily initially to be useful and interesting, and uh, to try to see things um, in as uh, varied a way as possible in order to work through that humongous um, blind spot separating the monk from the, uh, or whoever that is on the, on the coast of the, the image by Caspar uh, Friedrich uh, to to the relationship between that and the um, 
the clear open sky that apparently is, is somewhere out there beyond. Thank you.